Hi hobby friends, Azrak the Annihilator, oh yes. Allow me some real talk for a second. Most of us are here, at least in part, for the nostalgia, aren't we? It's an undeniable joy to while away a day over the tabletop with a mate, or sequester yourself in some corner of your home and apply pigments to the little folk. True, too, that touring the universe of 40k lore, that enormous project of the imagination that hundreds of creative minds have dedicated themselves to for approaching four decades now, is a most delicious escapism. But there is something particularly heady about the perfume of nostalgia, isn't there? You hit on an old piece of art in your Instagram scroll and whack! You are suddenly not a 30 to 40 year old with bills and busyness and boring battles to daily overcome. You're a kid on your belly, on your bed, in a splash of summer holidays sun with a new white dwarf in front of you, crisp and colourful and smelling a fresh magazine and filled ecstatically with a world of art and imagination. I mean, that art is usually some disgusting, gruesome, morbid or vile creation depicting all the very worst of everything, but it's somehow just the very coolest thing that there is, and you love it. Well then, imagine the endorphin rush I experienced when Warhammer Plus announced this year's exclusive mini as a three-dimensional rendition of Shawley, one of the most iconic bits of 40k art, Azrak the Annihilator by Mark Gibbons. With the World Eaters on their way and a little fizz of inspiration, now seems as good a time as any to tackle this legend of our youths. You've been watching me lay down the base work as I waffled on, a black prime, green zenithal and here some white volume sketching. The green may seem a weird choice, but with this next step, filtering over a red transparent tone, that will mix down into a nice rich brownish black for our shadows. If that little bit of colour magic piques your interest, I've got a whole playlist on the subject for you. Check out the links below, where you'll also find a list of the important paints used in this project. Time for some texture. The original Gibbons piece is full of gnarly lumps and bumps, and while this won't be a slavish recreation of the picture, I certainly want to catch the essence, and who doesn't love some grime with their grim? You might want to do this stage with a brush and a bunch of stipples, but I never feel like my stippling is quite random enough over large areas like this, so I'm going in with a sponge and three colours, purple, oxide red and a bright primary red, following all the light and shadow info that's already there and gleefully celebrating the actual physical texture a bit of sponging can give you. If anything, I didn't do enough of this. The highlights have also been picked out a little by adding a touch of white to the red and much later glazing over that with a straight red to tone it down a little bit. Deep breath now, it's time for the most time consuming job, blocking in all that trim. I feel like non-metallic metal is the only real choice here, at least for me, but that is going to mean that we need to put our patient head on and forget about time for a little while. Some hours later, and everything's gotten a good coat of very dark brown, and I've started on the next layer. Can I tell you anything about non-metallic metal that you haven't heard before? Probably not, but while I work away I will hit some of the major points. First, and most important, get yourself some references, and that doesn't mean other people's minis. It doesn't necessarily mean photos of real metal either, mind you. What we're interested in here is creating the illusion of metal, and luckily for us, there are lots and lots and lots of great 2D artists out there that have nailed the tricks. Careful dissection of what they're doing with colour and contrast will be a massive boost to your non-metallic metal confidence. Next is the old contrast. The thing that differentiates shiny metallic surfaces visually is the dynamic range across one area. That means your metallic materials need to have some very dark areas, and more importantly perhaps, some very light ones, preferably the lightest points on the whole mini. 
and you need to transition fairly quickly from one to the next. Not long, luxuriant gradients like you see on capes and smooth skin tones. Oh no, we need nice, tight transitions. Now, where you put those highlights can seem a bit tricky at times. One thing to bear in mind when working on trim like this is you should be imagining the trim not as lots of fiddly shapes around the bigger forms of the armor, but as big forms that happen to be interrupted by the ceramite panels. So, when you're working on a leg that has a mouth eating a planet on a knee and a bunch of arrows and etc 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 etc, first, imagine it's just a plain old cylinder. Where do the highlights go? Put them there. Just avoid the armor and only hit the trim. As the sketch progresses and refines, you'll start picking out the details of the shape more, but it's important that the broader areas of light and shadow are treated, well, broadly. Get the form, then the shape. This'll keep things coherent and believable. Stick around for an example of how not to do that a little bit later. Finally, on the non-metallic metal front anyway, two more thoughts to put into the pot. Have faith and carry on. Non-metallic metal spends about 80% of its time looking like bad non-metallic metal. And then, towards the end, when you start adding those really high highlights, and especially when you hit those edges with some sheen, then all of a sudden it starts to look like metal. So carry on and push those highlights further. Okie dokes, the trim is looking pretty good and it's time to hit the... Oh, oh dear. We've gone and done an oopsie. This is that example I was talking about where I wasn't paying attention to my bigger forms. The highlights here on the pauldrons do not match up. One is on top and one is in front. For spheroid shapes like this, in front is more correct, I'd say, so I took a minute to realign them. Much better. Okay, now we can hit those iron and steel bits. All the same principles as before, but now with different colors. Non-metallic metal is not about colors, it's about contrast and light. So, while getting recipes can be handy when you're starting out, you should be aiming to, quote, graduate to a broader way of thinking as soon as you have the fundamentals down. One difference here, of course, is that iron rusts, so let's get some browns and oranges washed on there too. Zip through some pipes and groobly bits, and it's now time to tackle that oozy, icky, unwholesome light that Mark Gibbons has infused his picture with. The first job is to bring up the value on this bad boy. A brush and some white paint is what we need, since extreme value contrast is the aim here. You will often see this step performed with an airbrush. The airbrush is fantastic at emulating the smooth and fast fall-off a light source and its light is subject to. But, like a wizard on a giant eagle, it is not a deus ex machina that can be applied willy-nilly. It is powerful, but subject to its own constraints and drawbacks. In this case, there are two reasons to go in with a brush. Control and texture. The control thing is pretty obvious. You can do some really fine work with an airbrush, but you can do finer work with a hairbrush every time. The second point about texture is a bit of an odd one to bring up with regards to light. In a narrow, sciencey sense, of course, light doesn't have texture. But look again at Gibbon's piece. I guess it's the light interacting with the smoke, but the point is, doesn't that green glow have a textural quality to it? It's kind of ragged, kind of oozy, kind of grimdark. So brush it is, and an attempt to emulate that feeling. Over the white, you can see, I went in with some nice vibrant green fluorescent paint and a little chartreuse here and there too. But that's not the only light this chap needs, is it? Right from the get-go, I've been avoiding doing much work around the back here because I knew what was coming. Some big impact environmental lighting. A lot of the original lighting sketch is pretty much intact around here. I just want to grab some edges and texture with some white. And when that's done, now it's time for the wizard on an eagle. Same green and chartreuse as before, working mostly from a bottom-up angle, but also making sure the light creeps around the corners a little bit for that deliciously ominous vibe. 
Okay, that has to be it for the body for now, I think. We need to finally put a head on those absurd shoulders. Or, since he's a termy, you know, between those absurd shoulders. As I do that, let me throw out an enormous and heartfelt thank you to the patrons that support me over on Patreon. These are they that make these videos possible. If you want to show your support too, you can join them via the link below. And of course, like and sub buttons are a hassle and money-free way of showing the love too. If Discord is your jam, we have a great channel open to all, and if you want a little something special painted mini-wise, take a look at my website where you can contact me about commission work. So we have grubbly stuppled and jabbled our way to a heinous skin tone, added some green underlighting, and backed and forthed on that cornate scarification. I think it's time to get Mr. A all pieced together, don't you? And here he is, Azrak himself, but alas, not the finished article. There is the not-so-small issue of the missing base, but there are also a few niggles here and there that I'd like to tackle. What do you reckon? Do any bits stand out to you that look in need of a little more attention? Let me know down below, and who knows, maybe next time your suggestions might be on this angry chap, or at least he'll have a standing place more befitting a malevolent skull smasher. Alright, cheers friends, I will see you next time.